who manage the institution. I just want to know who's going to manage the institution. This institution, who manages this institution? These are facetious questions. Maybe the most of them. Yes. This is about managing from the middle, leading from the middle. I will be honest, I've never been a rector. I've never been a president. I've never been a vice president. My entire career has been in the middle of the organization. I always answer to somebody. I've always supervised somebody. I've always been a peer of somebody. But I've never been a president or a vice president. My job is to understand what they want to do and how I can carry that out with the best of my ability. So this presentation really is about managing and leading from the middle of an organization. What I'm hoping that you'll get is you'll understand the difference between line and staff. Who's responsible for something, what we call downstream, or who is supportive in a supportive role? Um, what is it about that role of middle management and middle leadership and how do you lead from the middle and what does that mean concepts related to influence if you feel like you have no influence in an organization then you will be ineffective likely inefficient and you'll probably build all sorts of animosity Differences and similarities between leadership and followership. Followership is a relatively new field. Last 20 years, maybe. We'll talk a little bit about followership. What does it mean to follow? Does it just mean that you are a sheep following in line? Or does it mean that you'll be a courageous follower, clearly identifying what you need and how you can support the organizational hierarchy? And then tools to facilitate the growth of middle leaders. Can you get all that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just. He's going to go back one. That's yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, bugün şu liderlikle ilgili olacak. Uh, liderlikle ilgili olan bu oturumda temel olarak bilinmesi gereken katılımcıların bir iki önemli husus var. Bir bir sistemin içerisinde yönetici olmak ve orada çalışan olmak arasındaki benzerlikler ve farkların ne olduğu çok önemlidir. Orta yönetim olarak geçen ki Profesör Douglas kendisinden bahsetti. Hiç şimdiye kadar başkan bir kurumun en tepesindeki kişi olmadım. Her daim bana yukarıdan her zaman amirlerim oldu. Her zaman benim altında çalışanlar oldu. Her zaman benim denklerim oldu. O haliyle ortada olaraktan yönetime katılma kavramı olan ortadan yönetme kavramının bilinmiş olması çok önemli. Liderlikte etkinizin olduğunu bilmeniz çok önemli. Çünkü bir grubun üzerinde etkinizin olduğunu hissetmiyorsanız o gruba liderlik yapmak gibi bir şansınız kalmıyor. Onun dışında liderlik ve takipçilik, followership diye geçiyor. Bu takipçilik kavramı çok yeni bir kavram. 20 yıllık yaklaşık bir geçmişi var. Bu takip etmek demek ne demek? Ondan bahsedilecek. Ve onun dışında bu orta yöneticilerin, orta alanda bulunan yöneticilerin geliştirilmesi için e, kullanılacak e, yöntemlerden bahsedilecek. By the way, I think much better on my feet. I have to move around. So, who are the middle leaders? When, whenever I'm, I'm thinking about these kind of things, I ask myself questions. I always wondered what it was like to be Socrates. We would ask a, a, a question. So, what I try to do is think in terms of questioning. How do I, if I'm sitting in your seat, who are the middle leaders? What's the difference between middle leader and manager and a follower? Um, does it take courage to follow and what is courageous followership? Um, how do you navigate in the political waters? This is even applicable for the rector and the vice rector. Universities tend to be political animals, particularly in an institution that is in Turkey because there is a strong political connection. But in the United States we have the same thing. Our board of trustees are made uh, or are appointed through political uh, connections. 
Um, and then what role does integrity play in, in, uh, in influence? So how does one influence uh, another group and how important is it for me uh, to build that trust? So in 1989, Warren Bennis wrote a book on becoming a leader. And his ideas really spoke to the concept that managers and leaders, there are different, um, there are different tasks. There are different roles for managers and leaders. And so as you're looking at this and as you're reading and as we're speaking, think in terms of are these accurate? Are these accurate perceptions and is there a separation between management and leadership? The most pronounced here for me is managers do the right thing, leader, or I'm sorry, managers do things right and leaders do the right thing, which suggests that leaders are ethical, they have a moral obligation, they have integrity, and yeah. Managers got to do what they got to do. I'm not necessarily sure that that's accurate. I'm not sure that that's necessarily true. Um, Short-term ranges versus long-term ideas uh, keeps an eye on the bottom line, has the eye on the horizon. Uh, there's a book about the one-minute manager where there's the, uh, the author is looking out on the horizon, seeing what's available and seeing how he can move his organization. But it's a management book. It's how to get there. As you start to talk about your strategic plan, what is, it the, what is the vision that you want for your institution? All of those things can either be through leadership or management. But Bennis, I think, he was one of the first authors to really start to talk about the differences between leadership and management. Orta yönetim kavramında sorulması gereken önemli sorular var. Bunların ilki bu orta yönetici dediğimiz kişiler kimdir? Burada lider, yönetici ve demin bahsettiğimiz takipçi kavramlarının açıklamaları nelerdir? Sizi bir şeyi takip eden kişi olmak ile böyle başarılı azimli bir takipçi olmak arasındaki farkı ne belirler? Ve nasıl olur da politik o esintiler, politik gidişat, genel kurumun gidişatını etkiler ve e, kurum yöneticisi için kurumla birlikte olmak, kurumla yan yana, kurumun personeliyle yan yana durmak o kurum üzerindeki etkiyi nasıl belirler? Bunlar oldukça önemli sorular. Bu konuda e, Benis isimli e, e, yazarın 1989'da ilk çıkardığı, ilk onunla birlikte başlıyor. Yönetici ve lider arasındaki farklarla ilgili çok ciddi çalışmaları var. Burada ekranda şu anda şeylere temel özelliklerini gösteriyor görüyorsunuz. Yönetici için yönetir, lider yenilik getirir. Yönetici bir kopyadır, aynısını uygular. İşte lider orijinal fikirler üretir. İşte yönetici var olan sistemi korur, lider var olan sistemi geniş genişletir. Yönetici var olan sistemi ve yapıya odaklanır. Lider içerisinde bulunan kişiler üzerine odaklanır. Yönetici kontrol sistemine ne güvenir. Lider güven duygusu üzerine gider gibi yazılmış şeyler var. Ana temel farklılıklar var. Ama temel olarak çok güzel bir özet geçti biraz önce. Bir yönetici doğru işi yapar. Bir lider işi doğru yapar. No, no, not what? The manager does the right thing? Yes. Yes. The um, no. <laughs> no. no. Does things right. Does things does correctly. Things right. um, I know how to build a widget, so I do things correctly. I don't think in terms of. Um, and again, this is this is his idea behind. Um, Doing things correctly. Yes. Right. Managers do things correctly. Leaders do the right thing. That is what is right, what is moral, what is uh, ethical. That is that is what he proposes. But if you use that, 
mentality, then that would mean that the leader doesn't know how to do things correctly, and the manager never does anything right. So the bottom question then is, to what extent is Bennis correct or incorrect? I would argue that based on that, there might be some questions about his approach. So does that make sense? Do the right thing, do the correct thing, and then do things that are right, that are ethical and moral and leader. Do the right thing is efficiency, and do the things right, effectiveness, but we don't argue uh, managers do that all the time, and leaders do that. Yes, yes, yes, but Bennis decided he wanted to draw a difference yes. between the two. That's what it was. So, when we look at skills and abilities of managers, and how many people here manage either um, or lead uh, a department, program, students? Do you all manage things? Are you uh, any... Departmental directors, program directors. I manage my program. You manage your Somebody program. Somebody here pro manages his uh, departments. Okay. Department. How many people do that? Yes, we are all. You are all, all, right? Nearly all. Right. So these are basic, fundamental things that you should be doing, right? Yes. Well, notice that number two is leading, but you're a manager, so automatically we start to question Dennis and his concept that you can separate the two of these. Um, delegating, controlling, I have a whole other question on control because I don't believe you can control anything in higher education. Um, organizing and allocating or uh, application of resources, and that is a whole other issue that you have in Turkey. How much resources do you have? Can you get more resources? Do you manage your resources? Or are they just given to you? I would argue that you manage resources. You are given something, but you need to be efficient and effective with those limited resources. Yönetimin ana ilkelerinin arasında planlama, liderlik yapma, temsil etme, kontrol etme ki kontrol etme konusunda yüksek öğretimde Türkiye'de böyle bir kontrol mekanizmamızın olmadığını söyledi. Organizasyon ve kaynakların bu kullanılması, uygulanması ki bu iki son ikisi bağışlı başına bir konu çünkü kaynakları nasıl bulacağınız ne şekilde devamlılığını sağlayıp ne şekilde kullanacağınız başlı başına bir uh, bir konu oluyor. By the way, these are management principles from the American Society for Quality. So this is what they purport. It's interesting that I've been in management for 40 plus years and I can have stories about each one of these things. Uh, so under controlling Anybody hear of Michael Jordan? Anybody a basketball fan here? You've heard of Michael Jordan? There used to be a saying about Michael Jordan. You can't stop him, you can only hope to contain him. You can use that same similar adage to your departments or to what you're doing. Much of what happens in an institution of higher education is not controllable. We think we can. But in fact, what we really need to do is be responsive and reactive to what comes at us. So for, if it's a governmental pay cut or a governmental resource cut, or we get more, or we get more students that we can't, you know, we didn't expect, all of those things are out of our control, right? I've heard stories about the Turkey federal government and the, uh, the Council for Higher Education saying, oh, we want to add 20 more students to a program, but we're not going to give you the resources to do that. Well, do you have any control over that? No. no. But you can pivot, and you can be agile. And that's one of the things that you're trying to do as a manager and a leader. You're trying to be nimble and agile so that you can address those kind of issues. It should not be earth-shattering to get 20 more students. It's happened in the past. Somebody else has gone through it. Get together. Get an idea of how you want to approach that problem. Um, I think one of the things, and we could go through management theories, has anybody gone to a management course? Any MBAs here or business administration folks? You? So we could go through theories all day long, right? 
in essence, what's happening in higher education is we're moving away from this concept of a single point system to much more of a systemic thinking. How things interrelate to each other. Um, if you look back here at scientific management, I always say, you know, um, Taylor had this idea that there was one way to do things and only one way to do things, so you better do it, that'll make you more efficient. Um, my mother grew up that way. She's 95 years old, she still thinks there's one way to do something and that's the way you do it. Whereas you realize today, there's multiple ways of doing things. They can be just as effective, might even be more efficient than what somebody had originally thought. So when you think about this, we start thinking about systems thinking and situational complexity. We are living in a complex world that is constantly changing. You do not have the same education system that we had at the turn of the 20th century. We don't have the same education system we had 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Competition is much greater. By the year 2050, there will be 1.6 billion people in the world that have gone through the higher education system. Today, there's probably 200 million. It's constantly changing, and you have to be able to adapt to that. And so what you want to do is you want to have a basic understanding, a basic ground into these principles, but then be able to be agile, to be able to move. Look at interconnectedness, whether it's on the academic side where you're looking for interdisciplinary research, or whether it's on the administrative side that you're looking at interdisciplinary or interdepartmental uh, responses and actions to. Düşünce şekli düşünme tarzı dünyada hızlı bir şekilde değişiyor. İnsanların e, var olan şeylerin birbirleri arasındaki bağlantının ne olduğu çok sıkı bir şekilde takip edilmeli. Eski geleneksel düşünce sisteminde e, Profesör Douglas annesine örnek verdi. Herhangi bir şeyi yapmak için bir yolu varsa bu yaşına kadar gelmiş, o yolu değiştirmesi için hiçbir sebep yoktu. Halbuki bugünün dünyasında artık o kadar karışık, o kadar girift ilişkiler içerisinde olduğu, ki, olduğu için tek bir düşünce sistemi ve yöntemi bizi kurtarmamaktadır. Dolayısıyla zaman değiştikçe ona adapte olmak zorundayız. Aksi takdirde içerisinde hareket edebileceğimiz alanımız kalmıyor. Bundan dolayı da özellikle akademik ve disiplinler arası çalışmaların yerinde ilerleyebilmiş olması için bu düşünce genişliğine sağlam zamanlı bir şekilde adapte olup sistemi takip edebilmek gerekmektedir. Sistem yaklaşımı. Ma'am? Is your question? The systems thinking or systems approach really. Yes, systems thinking. Yes. So, as we start to look at styles, we start to see a change in management styles. It used to be transactional. I give you this, you give me that. I give you a salary, you give me this kind of work. We've got to move away from that to much more participatory, much more transformational. Transformational leadership talks about encouragement, talks about modeling. You don't expect anybody in your organization to be something, to do something without you modeling that behavior, building trust in that. Um, in that process, uh, challenging the process. Goes back to that original management, do the, do the same thing over and over and over again. Well, challenge the process. Is the process correct? Is the process right? Does the process get you the results that you want to get? Or are you just doing it because you have always done it that way? And finally, inspiring a shared vision. Even within your departments, you can take the institutional vision and you can apply that and share that vision and show the people within your organization, within your department, within your immediate reach, how to apply that vision. And then you can work with others on the peer side, ones that are on equal level with you. You share that, you reinforce that conversation. If it's quality assurance, that's how you develop a culture of quality is sharing that vision, sharing that understanding, the ideas behind quality. Yönetim şekillerinden bir tanesi bu değişimci, transformational yönetim şekli. 
birden fazla basamaktan oluşuyor. Öncelikle e, öncelikle cesaret vermeli yönetici kişiye, buradaki lider cesaret vermeli hareketin başlayabilmesi için. Ondan sonra kendiniz uygulamak istediğiniz sistemi kendiniz ortaya koyacaksınız, bir model olacaksınız. Bu şekilde sizinle birlikte çalışanlar onun ne olduğunu sizin uygulamanızda görecekler. Onlar gördükten sonra diğerlerinin harekete geçebilmesi için onları harekete geçirebiliyor olmuş olmanız lazım. Liderliğin oldukça önemli bir özelliği. Karşımıza çıkacak bütün zorluklara göz görebilmek, onlara hazır olmanız lazım. Ve en sonunda ilham verici olmuş olmanız lazım. Burada ilham vermek demek sizin o yaptığınız, o başardığınız faaliyeti, o ruhu kurumda çalışan diğer kişilerin de almasını sağlayabilmek lazım. Bir kurum kültürü bu şekilde kurulur. The concept of interdependence uh, was has been recently coined by a gentleman named uh, Stephen F., uh, Stephen Covey. He passed away a few years ago. But in writing a book called uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, he talked about what happens to an individual. And I kind of transformed that into what happens to an organization. Organizations tend to be move from dependence to independence to interdependence. Departments within an institution tend to move from dependence to independence to interdependent. In recent meetings I've had with um, some folks, they were really focused on the independence of a department. We want them to be able to do this independently. And I try to tell them, no, you want them to be able to do this interdependently. Because all of our problems, all of our operations and our institutions are systemic. They are all about interrelationship. You don't do anything by yourself. You can't hire anybody, you can't fire anybody, you don't have the resources, so you have to connect with all of those. If you're an academic department and you have research, you do research, you do teaching and learning and assessment, all of those may be different, may have different support mechanisms. As you start to enter quality, and this is the cre the a critical thing that I will I will talk again about tomorrow. Who here is on the Quality Commission? One person on the Quality Commission? No, here we have two, three, four, five, six. It is not their responsibility for quality. It is everybody in this room responsibility for quality my brother. It's my Turkish brother. It is everybody's responsibility for quality. If you think it's their responsibility, your quality uh, initiatives will fail. It is the interdependence of everybody on campus that brings those, those issues of quality together. That's what develops a quality culture. You cannot have a culture of anything that is not interdependent. Otherwise, you have a series of little blips all over. Bir kurumun önemli olan şey, ruhlarından sahip olması gereken özelliklerinden bir tanesi. Bu noktada interdependence terim olarak bilen birisi varsa, ben onu bilemedim, takip edebilirim size anladığım kadarıyla. Öncelikle kurum... Bir teknik terim ben de bu şey yapamadım, bilemediğim için ama ben tarif edeceğim. Kurum kendi iç yapısında bağımlı olarak başlar. Her bir birey, her bir parçası birbirine bağlıdır. Birbirine soru sormadan iş yapmaz. Kurumlar ilerlerken bağımsız olurlar. Kurumun içerisindeki alt birimler birbirinden bağımsız çalışabilirler ama kurumun da taşlarının yerine oturabilmesi için bu interdependence dediğimiz mertebeye, dayanışmaya ulaşması lazım. Her bir birim kendi içerisinde bağımsız olarak çalışırken bütün kurum aslında birbiriyle ilişki içerisinde gitmektedir. Bunun örneğini kalite komisyonundan kimler var aramızda diye sordu Profesör Douglas. Oradan 3 kişi, 4 kişi el kaldırdı. Önemli olan şey şu, resmi olarak kalite komisyonunda burada 4 kişi olmuş olabilir ama bu kurumun kalitesinden bu odada olan herkes istisnasız sorumludur. Eğer derseniz ki orası bağımsız bir kurumdur kalite komisyonu kendi işine kendisini yapar, biz de işimize bakarız o zaman bu işler burada yürümeyecek demektir. Bir bağlı Human resource management. I don't know what the system in Turkey is as far as hiring and firing and disciplinary actions and evaluating. 
But as a manager, the very least you are going to do is interrelate with your people that are close to you or peers or supervisors or subordinates. Human resource management is exactly that. You're supporting ongoing professional development, setting goals and objectives within your organization. And they should be tied. In essence, what you're doing is you're putting institutional vision and departmental vision into context. What does it mean for you to supervise a faculty member that doesn't understand that they have to implement quality processes in their teaching and learning? So the institution may say, we're going to develop as part of our strategy, as part of our strategic plan, the development of a quality assurance process. And yet if nobody develops quality assurance in their academic programs or in their uh, academic support programs, then you're not going to ever achieve that. And the only way that you do those things is achieving that through people. You have to work and develop relationships. Um, these other, these other areas, uh, recognition programs, a, a key one here might be succession planning. In the United States, we look at who is going to, who are we going to prepare to move into that next level? So we don't have chairs for life. We don't have program directors for life. We're looking for somebody within the organization to be able to accept new responsibilities and to move into that level. And so there is that expectation as an institution that you will develop people within the organization to move up the ladder, to move up the chain, so that they can actually accept more and more responsibilities. İnsan kaynakları yönetimi bir başka çok önemli olan kısımdır. Burada insan kaynakları yönetiminin çalışma ilkelerini belirlerken kullanılması gereken temel ilkeler var. Nedir bu? Kalite planının bir parçası olarak kullanılmalı bu. Dolayısıyla kurumun nereye gideceği konusunda hedefler belliyse o hedefler konusunda yardımcı olabilecek yeterliliği bulunan kişilerle çalışılmasını sağlamak insan kaynaklarının işidir. Bunun dışında e, kurum içerisinde yükselme faaliyetlerinde ihtiyaç olan e, birim neyse o konudaki yeterliliğe sahip olan personelin yetiştirilmesi veya seçilmesi yine insan kaynaklarından bu hususta alması gereken temel değerlerinden Financial management, and this is going to be a significant difference. Um, I operated at my first job in Texas. By the time I finished, my budget was about twenty million dollars U.S. When I went to um, Athens, Ohio, to be at Ohio University, my budget was about twenty to twenty-five million dollars U.S. That was my budget responsibility. Um, it included all people, all facilities, all programs, all revenue, and all expenses. So that financial management piece was essential, and my university sent me to American uh, Management Association for those things, and then I had an extremely good mentor. Um, but I've been in very, I've been to a number of uh, departments that had no idea how to manage. Um, how to manage their financial resources. Um, it's, it's critical, critically important, even if you have a fixed budget, to manage that budget. Even if you're not getting more money. Even if you can't get any more money. And then if those resources are inadequate to do your job, that's something that you need to forward up to the vice rector, to the general secretary, whoever's handling that budget, so that they know you may not get another dime, but you need to collect that data so that you can actually see throughout the institution. We could do this if we had more resources, but we don't have resources, so we have limited application. We can't do anything more. At my institution, they kept taking money away and away and away and away and expected me to do the same thing. And the only way we could do that was to generate more money. So we started, gen we started developing programs that were revenue generation. We generated 25% of our budget by the time I left. When I got there, 
we were generating about 15%. So we increased our budget by 10% over a 20 year period because we had to. I, it's not possible here. But it is possible to look at other ways of generating revenue. Um, and we talked to the rector about that at, at lunch. You know, you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to think about those things. But don't just think, well, I've got a budget, so I'll just look at the budget. Somebody's telling me what I got to spend, so that's it. It's hopeless. You know, even as a mental exercise, look at your budget, see if you can do it more efficiently and more effective, and come up with other ways to generate revenue. En önemli noktalardan bir tanesi bütçe. Burada pek çevrilik bir durum yok. Her şeyi zaten ve herkes biliyor ama bütçeyle ilgili Profesör Douglas dedi daha önce çalıştığım Texas Üniversitesi'ne 20 milyon dolarlık bir bütçeyi daha sonra Ohio Üniversitesi'ne 25 milyon dolarlık bir bütçeyi yönettim. Ama bütçeyi yöneten kişiyle kurumda görev yapan diğer kişiler o bütçenin nasıl döndüğü konusunda ortak bilgiye sahip olmak zorunda değiller. Bütçeyi yönetmek başlı başına bir iştir ama bütçe yönetiminde Sabit bir bütçeniz dahi olsa, işte devletten gelen parayla sınırlı dahi olmuş olsanız bu sizi bütçe konusunda çalışmalar yapmamaya yönlendirmemeli. Elinizdeki parayla ne yapabileceğinizi zaten planlamalısınız ama bunun dışında şu kadar paramız olsaydı şunları da yapardık planlarınızın da olmuş olması lazım. Aksi takdirde kendinizi sınırlamış olursunuz denildi. Bunun dışında bir kurumun, bir üniversitenin para getirisi yüksek olan programlara yönelik bir eğilim göstermesi gerektiği ortada ki kendileri de işte Amerika'daki üniversitelerin temel olarak yaptıkları ne kadar çok bütçe dönüşü olan bütçe dönüşü ne kadar yüksek ise bir programın o kadar o programı açmaya yönelik gidilmesi gerektiğini belirtti. Risk management and mitigation. We all go through risk. If you're managing anything, you have a risk. <gülüyor> The risk of a facility, somebody falling down, uh, you make a make a mistake in dealing with the students. All of those things are about risk. They all deal with risk. And so looking at what are known risks um, is essential in building a risk management or risk mitigation plan. Now, if I'm a finance guy, I'm looking at financial risk. But if I'm an operator, if I'm a manager, Uh, anybody in here that's in sport and recreation, if students aren't being taught how to manage risk um, when they're operating or working or coaching on an athletic field or working with athletes, all of those are risky business. That's what we do. We, we spend our time looking and developing a risk management plan, identifying potential risks, and mitigating those risks. So how many times do you walk a field to make sure that there's not a hole or make sure that there's not a void? Um, I looked at your track, your field looks great, there's a hole in your track. That's a problem, that's a risk. And so how do you mitigate that risk? Um, and again, whether it's facilities, or finance, or people, or whatever, you have to come up, and you have to know, first of all, that those are risks, and then you have to come up with a plan to mitigate those risks. Risk yönetimi bir başka önemli bir madde. Öncelikle herhangi bir yerde yöneticiyseniz sizin riskiniz vardır. Bu kaçınılmaz bir durum. Ve bundan dolayı da her kurumun bir risk yönetim planı olmalıdır. Bütün riskler baştan göz önünde bulundurulmalı, göz önünde alınmalı. Riskin olması durumunda yapılacak işler belirlenmelidir. Eğer böyle bir risk planınız yoksa spor fakültesindeki öğrencilerin sahada koşuyor olmaları dahi an itibariyle bir risktir. Her şeyin olması mümkündür. Böyle bir durumda yapılması gereken bu risklerin nasıl azaltılacağı ve yok edilebileceği ile ilgili çalışmaların yapılmasıdır. This is another place where you look at Michael Jordan. You can't stop him. You can only hope to contain him. You can't stop. You cannot control problems. They are inherent in what we do. You can only hope to be able to be agile and nimble and develop a plan and and actually look at when you do something, look at the intended consequences and the possible unintended consequence of your actions. Bu nokta tekrar 
Michael Jordan'a döndüğümüz kısım ki bir önceki şeyi ben anladım bizim için tekrar değil Türkçesinde. Michael Jordan için meşhur bir söz var. Onu durduramazsınız. Sadece böyle bir alanda korumaya çalışabiliriz. Yani muhafaza edebilirsiniz. Bu risk de aynen böyledir. Bir riski durdurmanız mümkün değildir. Yapabileceğiniz en iyi çalışma o riskin gerçekleşmesi durumunda sizin kasti veya iste, kasti olmayan olumsuz sonuçlarınızın minimuma indirilmesi veya yok edilebilmesi için yapılacak önlemler konusunda çalışmaktır. We live in a world now where knowledge is the industry. We're creating data at, at exponential speed. It's no longer static. You cannot expect to teach students about a fixed amount of information not possible today. So you have to teach them how to learn. The same thing happens in our departments. Things change on, at, at great speeds. And so how you take in data, how you use that data um, to manage your area uh, is essential. And all of that knowledge then is used in the development of quality assurance processes. So quality assurance is based on data making data-driven decisions. So that's why that is so important and it's promoted through best practices. Bilgi yönetimi bir başka çok önemli kısım. Çünkü kalite yönetiminin en önemli bacağı bilgiye sahip olmaktır. Dolayısıyla kurumun belirlemesi gereken önemli noktalardan bir tanesi de bilginin ne şekilde toplanabileceği, ne şekilde paylaşılacağı ve paylaşılan bilginin ortaya ne şekilde uh, uh, <clears throat> every organization that I've ever dealt with says they have one major problem, and that's communication. Largely because they probably don't understand what communication is. They believe it's a one-sided, I'm going to tell you stuff. Frankly, this is a fantastic example of the possibility of communication failure. <laughs> I'm giving you information, there's information there, and I have a translator that is translating that information. You have three inputs. Do I have any inputs? No. Mm -mm. Every once in a while you smile, you smile. Some people are just going, oh my God, wait, wait for them to get over. If I get somebody like that where you're looking at me, one of the reasons when I taught and when I do these kind of things, I want to get out. I want to make that contact because that gives me nonverbal feedback. When I speak in Turkey, I can tell who understands English and who doesn't because sometimes they'll just look at And I try to, it's important for me to differentiate somebody that understands me that just doesn't care versus somebody that doesn't understand me and is bewildered. Those are different things. So communication is both the delivery and the reception and then the use of that. And so when we look at communication techniques, we have all of these different kind of ways for us to communicate with each other. And so it's important for me to, you know, rather than standing up there, I want to come out there and I want to look at you. One, it might make you feel, oh crap, somebody shot me now. I used to do that in class all the time to make sure that I had somebody's attention. İletişim bir başka önemli bacağımız. İletişimin ne olduğu bu hususta çok iyi bilinmeli. Çünkü iletişimin ne olduğu çok iyi bilinmediği için genel olarak ortada bir iletişim olmuyor. Çok kaliteli iyi olmayan iletişim örneklerinden bir tanesini aktif olarak şu anda biz sergiliyoruz. Profesör Douglas size konuşuyor, burada bir çevirmen onu size çeviriyor. Profesör konuşurken kim ne kadar anlıyor, ne kadar anlamıyor konusunda yüzlerinize bakıyor. 3-4 kişi kendisine bakıp kafayı sallıyorsa mutlu oluyorum. Onun ağzından çeviriyorum, o zaman mutlu oluyorum. O daha yaklaşık bir şeyler anlatmaya çalışıyorum ama Yüzünüze baktığımda sadece bir sabit gülümseme vardıysa, aha eyvah bana bir şey mi soracak endişesini hissediyoruz. 
Dolayısıyla bu iletişimin daha kaliteli olması için işte mesajı gönderen kişiyle mesajı alan kişinin arasındaki o bağın çok daha sağlam kurulmuş olması gerekir. In a personal communication, having that discussion where people sit around, talk about things, constantly communicate with each other as you're trying to move forward, when you think in terms of inter, anything that says inter is this concept that you're working together on something. You're communicating with each other, that interpersonal relationship. Understanding that when you're in a room, and you know what, it's 2.47 in the afternoon, everybody's had lunch, they're probably all real tired, it's a little warm, and this would be really bad on a Friday because everybody would want to go home. And so understanding that, having empathy, if you know somebody in your department that's struggling, parent has just passed away, um, they've, had a, they've got a sick child, knowing that creates empathy, knowing that um, those issues in somebody's life beyond, hey, did you teach a class today? How'd you do in your class? Well, my class really didn't go well because last night I struggled because I was up all night with a sick child. Stephen Covey tells a story, and I don't know how this is going to translate. We try. Stephen Covey tells a story about empathy and about paradigm shift. A man is on a train. He's going back and forth, probably going from Ankara to Eskishir, Eskishir to Istanbul. He does this every day. All he wants to do is sit and read the newspaper. Does not want to be bothered. Screaming children all over the train. Running up and down. Dropping stuff, yelling and screaming. He looks at the father of these children and says, you know, it's been a long day. Could you just keep your kids quiet and out of my hair? And he said, well, we just came from our, her mom's or their mom's funeral. And I thought I'd let them run a little bit. thought I'd let them let out some of that energy. That feeling that you just had from a aggravated person, and you could all empathize with that, to, oh my God, kids just lost their mother. That paradigm shift is what they're looking at. That's, what, that's interpersonal relationships. Understanding that basic piece of humanity. That's required in interpersonal relationship. And if you can capture that as a manager or as a leader, you will go, you will go far. You will understand it. And you will be able to see the ones that don't, the ones that could care about anything else. Good luck. And <laughs> <laughs> then the story part was the easy part. Bir sonraki önemli noktalardan bir tanesi kişiler arası olan iletişim. Buradaki en önemli bacak empati duygusundan bahsetti profesör. Kurumun içerisinde çalışan herkes, var olan herkes birbirine karşı o empati duygusunu kurabiliyor olmak zorunda. İşte dersten çıkan bir işte akademisyene işte dersini yaptın mı dersin nasıl gitti demek de olabilir. Ama onun dışında hepimizin şu anda işte hasta bir çocuğunun evde bekliyor olabilme ihtimali olduğunu bilmek veya direkt bu şu andaki toplantıdan örnek verdi. Şu anda saat 2 oldu. Öğleden sonra yemeği yedik. Herkes bir miktar zaten ama içmiş durumunda. Zaten oda da sıcak bir oda. Dolayısıyla yani bir de cuma olsaydı üzerine tam böyle artık vur gitsin olacaktık diye belirtti. Bunun farkında olmalı ve bunun farkında olduğunuz için de işte nasıl oluyor da siz işte dinlemeniz kadar gereken kadar dinlemiyorsunuz gibi bir çıkış yapmamak lazımdır dedi. Bir de üzerine hikaye. Somebody called Stephen was the, I didn't catch the surname but the, the Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry. İsimli bir şahsın anlattığı hikayeyi bir 
trende sürekli git geri yapan bir şahıs İstanbul Eskişehir arası Ankara arası olduğunu varsayalım hızlı trende bu her gün gidiyor gidiyor geliyor yaptığı tek şeyi oturup gazetesini açıp okumak yine bu seferlerden bir tanesinde bir adam iki çocuğuyla birlikte aynı vagonda çocuklar ortalıkta hollayıp zıplayıp bağırıp çağırıp ellerindeki malzemeleri yere atıp o miktarda gürültülü bir yolculuk derken işte adam çocukların babasına dönüyor ya çocuklarınıza biraz sahip olur musunuz yani sessiz olsunlar bu da kafa gibi bir serzenişte bulunuyor. Adamın verdiği cevap ya diyor kusura bakmayın diyor annelerin cenazesinden geliyoruz şu anda. Yani çocukları yerinde tutamadığım için enerjilerini atsalar iyi olur gibi düşünüyorum. Diyor işte burası bir yöneticinin, yönetici olacak kişinin baştan planlaması gereken böyle bir ihtimalin olacağı ile ilgili güzel bir örnek. Um, communication technology you love it, you hate it It does not necessarily communicate what you want. It communicates data, facts. Can't see my face. Sometimes you can be really ugly on technology. Social media is, is both good and bad. But that communication technology, you have to be very careful when you're transmitting information. You can try to put some kind of inflection in there, but sometimes it comes across flat. And so understanding technology protocols and understanding who's receiving your, um, your electronic communication, how you communicate over technology. Um, we have a president in the United States that thinks that Twitter is the only way to communicate in the world. And he creates more, more havoc with Twitter than anything. So it's using the right technology for the right purpose to get across that message and making sure that you don't convolute the message and thinking through the process. İletişim teknolojileri günümüz içerisinde bambaşka bir güzellik ve sorun aynı zamanda. Çünkü bu teknolojileri sosyal medyaya kullanırken çok dikkatli olmalısınız. Çünkü sizi oldukça güzel gösterebildiği gibi oldukça böyle güzel olmayacak çirkin şekilde de gösterebilir. İletişim teknolojilerini kullanırken ne mesaj yazdığınız çok çok önemlidir. Kime yazdığınız, nereye gönderdiğiniz bu son derece ağır bir dikkat isteyen sorumluluktur. Amerika'da bizim hocamın ağzında konuşuyorum. Bizim Amerika'da Twitter tek başına her şeye yeter gibi bir grup ile gidiyor. I don't know what he said, but I completely agree. <gülüyor> This is the trust between us, right? <gülüyor> um, management quality assurance. I, I love this quote by W. Edwards Deming. I'm a W. Edwards Deming guy, right? Plan do check act cycle, uh, turn Japanese manufacturing into uh, a world powerhouse after World War II. Um, funny thing was, he tried to bring those same kind of statistical, data-driven quality assurance model to American uh, uh, production and industry, and they all said, nah, we don't need that. Well, why would we need that? We are the biggest, most powerful world or country in the world. It only took them 40 years to realize that they needed to move to a quality assurance cycle. And then all of a sudden you started seeing uh, organizations and people co-opting that original continuous quality improvement cycle, that plan, do, check, act. So I don't talk about anybody but them. I like the original. Plan, do, check, act, cycle. Here he says, quality begins with the intent which is fixed by management. That's you. You are going to determine quality. Your rector, your vice rectors are going to determine the quality that you want. So understand that quality is going to be different based on the role and function of your institution. You cannot aspire to be an institution that is fundamentally different than you are. And I always go back to Harvard. You know, $40 billion endowment. Anybody here got a $40 billion endowment? Nah, probably not. We don't have one at our institution. And so you establish the quality levels that you want based on the criteria and the standards that you're looking at 
and then you basically build the quality assurance processes. That's what management's all about. That is what management, the function of management, the quality assurance process is to do exactly that. Edward Deming'e oldukça hayranım köşede, hocamın ağzından anlatıyorum. Köşedeki yazı, yazısından dolayı en önemli şeylerden bir tanesi niyetin kurulmasıdır. Yani amacın, hedefin belirlenmiş olmasıdır. Ki aşağıdaki sözde kalite niyet ile başlar ki bu niyet yönetim tarafından belirlenir. Diyor ki buradaki yönetim sizsiniz. Bu yönetim buradaki herkes burada rektör, rektör yardımcısı. Buradaki niyetin, hedefin ne olduğunu belirler ve ona göre a, gidilir. Ve bu yapılırken en önemli şeylerden bir tanesi kurumun kendi iç yapısını, dinamiklerini çok iyi bilip ona göre gerçekçi bir niyet e, ortaya çıkarmasıdır. Çünkü yapısal olarak sizden farklı olan bir kurum gibi olma gibi bir niyet ile yola çıkarsanız teknik olarak bu mümkün değildir. Oraya ulaşamazsınız. Demi builds quality assurance based on the system, basically understanding those interdependent parts of that system. What are those nodes? What are those connections? And so what he talks about is if you can't describe what you're doing in a process, then you don't know what you're doing. You should be able to put a process. You'll notice that in many of my present or my presentation this morning, you'll also see it tomorrow, is I flow everything out. Because I want to see the process of the presentation. I want to see the process of the accreditation. I want to see the process of the self-study. And so for me, I'm a visual learner. I want to see that process. I can explain that process. So when you think about that, when you think about what you want to do, it's not good enough just to say, well, yeah, we're doing this. You want to be able to visualize it. You want to be able to articulate it and communicate it with the people that you're, you're working with. Bir sonraki, bir sonraki önemli nokta sistemi anlamak. Aa, sistemi anlamak derken biraz önce geçti. O eski anneanne örneğini verdiğimiz tek bir doğru vardır. O senelerce o doğru yolu değiştirmek için gerek yoktur. Halbuki şimdiki dünyanın girip sisteminin içerisinde birden farklı düşünce mekanizmasını uygulayabilmek lazım. O sistemi kabul etmek lazım. Bu kurum için en önemli şeylerden bir tanesi. Bu sistemi düşünme şeklinde kabul etmek ve yapılacak uygulamaları o sistemi kalitesini arttıracak yönünde e, seçmektir. Sistemin düşünce şeklini kabul etmek demek sizin için yaptığınız işi tanımlayabilme yeteneğine sahip olmak anlamına geliyor. Alt tarafta yine e, Edward Deming'in bir sözü var. Diyor ki bir Yaptığınız işi bir süreç olarak tarif edemiyorsanız siz ne yaptığınızın farkında değilsiniz demektir. Diyor yaptığınız her işin bilimsel olması için bir süreç olarak tanımlanabilir durumda olmuş olması lazım. Sistemin düşünce şekli bu. So going back to Deming or going back to uh, Venice, I think we can say that leadership and management go hand in hand. They're not separate. They're not separate functions. You don't manage certain things, you don't lead certain things. Those things are interconnected. You can see here from the Venn diagram, there are certain elements that are going to be, uh, require both management and leadership. Um, they're not the same, but they're linked and they're complementary. And finally, any effort to separate those things um, creates problems. And believe me, I've been in institutions where they've had managers and they believe that they have a function and they have what they perceive as leaders and they have a function and the organization is usually dysfunctional. Liderlik ve yönetim son 5-6 slide'da sunumun ana e, konuları bu. Bu ikisi birbiriyle omuz omuza el ele giden iki kavramdır. Birbirinin aynısı değillerdir ama birbirleriyle de son derece bağlıdırlar. Ee, ve Profesör Gargulası bahsetti, örneklerini gördük. Bunlardan bir tanesini diğerinden ayırmaya çalışmak, yani sadece bir manager olup lider olmamak veya sadece bir lider olmak ve manager olmamak size sadece sorun getirecektir. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Do you have any questions? Any questions so far? Evet, soru soranlardan soruyorum.
Yes, sir. Could uh, expectation be uh, an effective input uh, regarding quality? I mean, I'm doing my PhD in marketing, and uh, quality perception may differ from consumer to consumer regarding their expectations. Yes. Since we are an educational institution, our consumers are main students. So should we be able to uh, check their expectations from time to time? Yeah, but I would argue with the fact that is your, is your primary target students? Or is your primary target society? Or is your primary target the government? Or is your primary target the, the parents? Or is your primary target something else? So to answer your question, yes, you should always be asking expectations. That's stakeholder review, stakeholder understanding what they, what is the, what is different in the expectation of a student, and not all students have the same expectation. However, 90% have one thing in mind. What is that? Does anybody know? That's in the course. That's in the class. No, they don't care about any of that stuff. <laughs> What's the one expectation that a student, a student gets? Say what? Earning money. Earning money. The J-O-B. I've done survey after survey after survey when students first come into college. They all say the same exact thing. J-O-B. That's why I came to college. That's my expectation. You're going to give me the skills I need to get a job. Is that the only reason why we're here? Is that the only purpose of higher education? No. No. We benefit society. Do you know that a college graduate in the United States, his average salary is one million dollars more than a high school graduate? They say what? Over their lifetime. Their, um, their health care is better. Their health, physical health is better. They vote more, they participate more in community activities. They are overall better citizens. I asked every student, is that important? Not at that time. I want the job. J-O-B, I want to make money. I make all my decisions based on the J-O-B. So, to answer your question directly is yes, you should be asking expectations that should be a part not only, to students. not only to students what do their parents expect of them what do your community leaders expect you have a great opportunity here i've been talking to the rector about your experiential learning programs with local industry and local local businesses fantastic that experiential learning is going to move you into a position where you will really be um, a, a well sought after institution uh, of higher education because that's a great model but if you ask a student that they won't know anything about that so you you've got to be very careful when you ask people what their expectations are depends on context depends on who they are what they're thinking about any other questions no other questions thank you Thank you very much.